Welcome. We will now read a brief section of the language of the goddess entitled Categories of Symbols. A close look at symbolic associations greatly reduces the number of symbolic meanings. The classification of the symbols into interrelated groups is reflected in the division of the book into four parts with distinct themes. Part 1, Life-Giving. Part 2, The Renewing and Eternal Earth. Part 3, Death and Regeneration. Part 4, Energy and Unfolding. The first category of symbols embraces the aquatic sphere, since the prevalent belief was that all life comes from water. The symbols of water expanses, streams and rain, zigzags, wavy or serpentine bands, net, checkerboard, and of waterfowl belong here and are associated with the goddess in the form of a woman-waterbird hybrid. In schematic versions, this image may only have breasts or exaggerated posteriors. This rich group of symbols is undoubtedly Paleolithic in origin. The beginning of the portrayal of the parts of the female body, breasts, buttocks, belly, vulva, goes back to the times when people did not yet understand the biological processes of reproduction, copulation as the cause of pregnancy, created a deity who was, macro who was a macrocosmic extension of a woman's body. She is cosmic creatrix, life and birth giver. These essential parts of the female body were endowed with the miraculous power of procreation. The mysterious moisture in the uterus and the labyrinthine internal organs of the goddess were the magical source of life. The birth-giving goddess who is represented in natural birth-giving posture, give me a moment to navigate to the top of the page, the birth-giving goddess who is shown in birth-giving posture, is difficult to find in the navigating, or by her vulva as pars pro total, part as whole, is present in the upper Paleolithic. These symbols continued into the Neolithic and even later. She is linked with primeval mothers in animal form such as the bear, deer, doe, elk, doe, and in the upper Paleolithic as the sh with the she-bison and the mare. The preservation of such images into the later prehistoric and even historic era can be explained not only by the indestructibility of deeply ingrained life-giving mat and maternity symbols, but also a strong memory of a matrilineal system when, pa when paternity was difficult to establish. It does not mean, however, that the paternal role in the process of reproduction was not understood in the Neolithic or at the latest in the Copper Age by people who were such keen observers of nature. Innovations occurred with the advent of the Neolithic economy. The ram, the earliest domesticated animal, became, the, became sacred to the bird goddess, followed by the fleece symbol and the association of the goddess with weaving and spinning. The beginning of the concept of the life and birth giving goddess as a fate, an appartitioner and determiner of the length of life, happiness, and wealth and as a spinner and weaver of human life may go back to this early Neolithic period. At the same time, the discovery of pottery opened avenues for the creation of new sculptural forms, as well as new ways of expressing symbols through pottery painting. Ascoy, bird-shaped vases, and anthropomorphic or bird-woman vases appeared. Streams, chevrons, triangles, neck pa net patterned bands, spirals, winding snakes, and snake coils became dominating motifs in pottery painting. Ceramic vessels as the life-giving goddess marked with M's, zigzags, water streams, or amniotic fluid, nets, spiraling water, waves, and other aquatic signs made their debut in the 6th millennium BC. Going up. Okay. Sorry that navigating is so difficult. Here we are. The fertility and pregnancy symbols also have roots in the Upper Paleolithic. The pregnant goddess is already there. The byline, two dashes, is recorded in the Upper Paleolithic as a symbol of pregnancy or of the strength of two. As a consequence of the new farming economy, the Paleolithic pregnant goddess was transformed into an earth fertility deity. 
the fecundity of humans and animals, the fertility of crops, the thriving of plant cover, and the process of growing and fattening were now of enormous concern. The sow, as a fast-growing and fast-fattening animal, became sacred to this goddess. Originally probably a lunar goddess, fattening like the waxing moon, the pregnant goddess of the agricultural era became a Chthonic earth deity, symbolic of the rising, flourishing, and dying vegetation. The drama of seasonal changes is intensified, which is manifested in summer, winter, or spring harvest rituals, and in the emergence of a mother-daughter image, and of a male god as a spirit of rising and dying vegetation. As this book documents, throughout prehistory, images of death do not overshadow those of life. They are combined with symbols of regeneration. The death manager, messenger, and death wielder are also concerned with regeneration. Innumerable examples testify to the existence of this motif. Vulture heads are placed within breasts. Jaws, tusks of ferocious boars are covered with breasts, as in the 7th millennium BC Katalhayuk shrines of central Turkey. Images of Western Europe owl goddesses on the tomb walls of megalithic, megalithic glaives, graves and on stelae have breasts, or their inner body is a life-creating labyrinth with a vulva in the center. Moving on. As a symbol of regeneration, the uterus as such, or similarly shaped bucranium, the form of the skull of an ox, or analogous animal forms, fish, frog, toad, hedgehog, turtle, played a role throughout most of the post-Paleolithic prehistory, as well as in later history. During the Neolithic, graves and temples assumed the shape of the egg, vagina, and uterus of the goddess, or of her complete body. The megalithic passage graves of Western Europe quite probably symbolized the vagina passage and pregnant belly tholos round chamber of the goddess. The shape of a grave is an analog of the natural hill with an umphalos stone symbolizing the navel on top, a universal symbol of the earth mother's pregnant belly with umbilical cord as recorded in European folk beliefs. The interplay of life and death-giving functions in a divinity is particularly characteristic of dominant goddesses. The life and birth giver can turn into a frightening image of death. She is a stiff nude or mere bone with a supernatural pubic triangle where the transformation from death to life begins. The occasional ornithomorphic features of her mask, bird features of her mask, and her vulture's feet portray her connection with the bird of prey, and the ophidian features, snake features, long mouth, fangs, and small round eyes link her with the poisonous snake. The stiff nude of the upper Paleolithic, carved in bone without the protuberances of a life producing body is the ancestress of the old European stiff nude, which was made of marble, alabaster, light-colored stone, or bone, materials having the color of death. The masks of the goddess of death, mid-5th millennium BC, with large mouth and fangs, and sometimes a hanging tongue, may have generated the Gorgonian the fearsome monster head of ancient Greece. The earliest Greek gorgons, however, are not terrifying symbols that, that turn humans into stones. They are portrayed as having the wings of a bee and snakes as antennae and are decorated with a honeycomb design, all clearly symbols of regeneration. Of the largest, one of the largest of these categories can be classified as symbols of energy and unfolding. Spirals, horns, crescents, half circles, U-shapes, hooks, axes, hounds, he-goats, and excited, iffy phallic men with boners, which flank a rising watery life column, serpent, tree of life, and anthropomorphic goddess or her pregnant belly are all energy symbols. Antithetic snake or spiral heads fill old European vase painting with motion and twisting. Whirls, crosses, and a variety of four-corner designs are symbols of the dynamism in nature which secures the birth and life and turns the wheel of cyclic time from death to life, so that life is perpetuated. 
In this series of transformations, the most dramatic is the change from one life form into countless others, from a bird cranium to bees, butterflies, and plants, epiphanies of the goddess of regeneration. The iconography of the goddess and her various aspects always contains several types of symbols, abstract or hieroglyphic, such as V, X, M, triangle, diamond, etc., representational, such as eyes, breasts, bird, feet, and animal, which are attributes of the various aspects of the goddess, snake, bird, sow, frog, bee, etc. These three categories are tightly interwoven and stem from a holistic perception of the world when nature was not classified as in modern universities, as if when nature was not classified as in modern universities, when humans were not isolated from the surrounding world, and when it was normal to feel the goddess's power in bird or stone, or in her eyes or breasts alone, or even in her hieroglyphs. In each part of this book, I shall deal with all of these categories. So let's dwell on that last paragraph for just a moment longer. She talks about three categories of symbols. Right, so the iconography of the goddess in her various aspects always contains several types of symbols. Abstract hieroglyphics, such as V, X, M, triangle, diamond, etc. So these are things that today we would consider true symbols. They, they seem to represent in some kind of abstract semantic network. They, they mean something which they clearly are not. Um, or at least the, the iconism of what they mean is, is highly, highly reduced. Uh, to the point where they, they really don't look like icons, they look like symbols. And then there's representational, such as eyes, breasts, bird, feet, right? So these are icons of the goddess in, in more direct form. And then, a and then animals, which are attributes of the goddess, goddess. So these are indexical, right? The animal is connected with the goddess, is the goddess in some way, but it's also a correlate of the goddess. So you see these three categories of icon, index, and symbol in this, in all of these artifacts, but they're not as clearly differentiable as they are in modern literate life. And so that allows the meanings of these artifacts to be much more ambiguous, but still very present. And that's one of the things that I want to explore in going over this book, is how how meaning is is more malleable and flexible here than it is in our world, and the implications of what kind of sentences, what kind of claims can be made using this more ambiguous form of meaning. All right, so that's the finished we're done with the, the, the summary of the kinds of symbols, and now we're going to get into chapter one in the next video.